upstairs lived. She had gone up there once with her real mother. When her when her mother was collecting for charity, they had stood in the open doorway waiting for the crazy old man with a big mustache to find the envelopes that Carlin's mother had left, and the flat had smelled of strange foods and pipe tobacco and odd sharp uh, cheesy smelling things Carlin could not name. She had not wanted to go any farther inside than that. I'm an explorer, said Coraline out loud, but her words sounded muffled and dead on the misty air. She had and she had made it out of the cellar, hadn't she? And she had, but if there was one thing that Coraline was certain of, it was that this flat would be worse. She reached to the top of the house the topmost flat of once she had the attic of the house. But that was a uh, long ago. She knocked on the green painted door and swung open the and she walked in. Oh I gotta show you this picture. Yeah, it's kinda scary. We have eyes and we have nerves. We have tails. We have teeth. You all get what you deserves. When we rise from underneath, whispered a dozen or more tiny voices, in the dark flat with the roof so low where she, where it met the walls that Garland could almost reach up and touch it. Red eyes stared at her. Little pink feet scurried away as she came close. Darker shadows slipped through the shadows at the edges of things. It's much, much worse in here than in real than the real crazy old man upstairs flat. This, that smell of food, unpleasant food to Coraline's mind, but she knew that was a matter of taste. She did not like spices, herbs, or exotic things. This place smelled as if all the exotic foods in the world had been left out to go rotten. Little girl, said a rustling voice in a far room. Yes, said Coraline. I'm not frightened, she told herself, and as if she thought it, she knew that it was true. There was nothing here that frightened her. These things, even the things in the cellar, were illusions, things made by the other mother in, uh, in a ghastly parody of real people and real things on the other end of the corridor. She could not truly make anything to decided Coraline. She could only twist and copy and distort things that already existed. And then Coraline found herself wondering why the other mother would have placed a snow globe on the drawing room. Mantelpiece for the mantelpiece in the Coraline's world was quite bare. As soon as she had asked herself the question, she realized that there was actually an answer. Then the voice came again, and her train of thought was interrupted. Come here, little girl. I know what you want, little girl. It was a rustling voice, scratching and dry. It made Caroline think of some kind of enormous dead insect, which was silly, she knew. How could a dead thing, especially a dead insect, have a voice? She walked through several rooms and low slanting ceilings until she came to the final room. It was a bedroom, and the other crazy old man upstairs sat at the far end of the room, in the near darkness, bundled up in his coat and hat. As Coraline entered, he began to talk. Nothing's changed, little girl, he said, his voice sounding like a noise. Dry leaves make as they rustle across the pavement. And what if you do anything, I mean, everything you swore you would? What then? Nothing changed. You'll go home. You'll be bored. You'll be ignored. No one will listen to you. Not really listen to you. You're too clever and not quite for them to understand. They don't even get your name right. Stay here with us, said the voice from the finger, from the figure at the end of the room. We will listen to you and play with you and laugh with you. Your other mother will build whole worlds for you to explore and tear, tear them down every night when you're done. Every day will be better and brighter than the one that went before. Remember the toy box, how much better would a world 
to be built just like that and all for you then will there and will there be gray wet days where I just don't know what to do and there's nothing to read or watch and nowhere to go and the day drags on forever as Coraline from the shadow the man said never and will there be awful meals with no maid no food made for recipes with garlic and tarragon and broad beans in as Coraline every meal will be a thing of joy whispered the voice from under the old man's hat nothing will pass your lips that does not entirely delight you and I could have a day glow green gloves to wear and yellow wellington boots in the shape of frogs asked Coraline frogs, ducks, rhinos, octopus whatever you desire the world will be built new for you every morning if you stay here you can, you ha can have whatever you want Coraline sighed you really don't understand, do you? She said, I don't want whatever I want. Nobody does. Not really. What kind of fun would it be if you just got everything I ever wanted? If I, got, I just got everything I ever wanted, just like that, and it didn't mean anything. What then? I don't understand, said the whispery voice. Of course you don't understand, she said, raising the stone up with the hole in her in it to her eyes. You, you're you just a bad copy she made of a crazy old man upstairs. Not even that anymore, said the dead whispery voice. There was a glow coming from the raincoat of the man in about chest height through the hole in the stone. The glow twinkled and shone blue white as any star. She wished she had a stick or something to poke him with. Then she had no wish to get any closer to the shadowy man at the end of the room. Coraline took a step closer to the man, and he fell apart. Black rats leapt from the sleeves and from under the coat, and had a score of, or more of them, red eyes shining in the dark. They glittered, and they fled, and the coat fluttered and fell heavily down to the floor. The hat rolled into the corner of the room. Coraline reached out with one hand and pulled the coat open, and it was although it was greasy. Oh, so gross. <laughs> although it was greasy to the touch, there was no sign of a final glass marble in it. She scanned the room, squinting through the hole in the stone, and thought sight of nothing, I mean, something that twinkled and burned like a star at the floor level by the doorway. It was being carried in the four paws for the largest black rat. As she looked, it slipped away. The other rats watched her from the corners of the room as she ran after it. Now rats can run faster than people, especially over short distance, but a large rat holding a marble in its two front paws is no match for a determined girl, even if she was small for her age, moving at a run, smaller black rats ran back and forth across her path, trying to distract her, but she ignored them all, keeping her eyes fixed on the one with the marble, who was heading straight out, out of the flat, toward the front door. They reached the steps out outside the building Coraline, had time to observe that the house itself was continuing to change, becoming less distinct and flat, uh, flattening out. Even as she raced down the stairs, it, it reminded her of a photograph of a house now, and um, not the thing itself. Then she was simply racing pell-mell pell down the steps in pursuit of the rat, with no room in her mind for anything else, certain she was gaining it on it. She was running fast, too fast. She discovered as that she came to the bottom of the of one of the flight of stairs, and her foot skipped and twisted, and she went crashing onto the concrete landing. Her left knee was scraped and skinned, and the palm of her hand she had thrown out to stop herself 
was a mess of scraped skin and grit. It hurt a little and it would. She knew soon hurt much more. She picked the grit of her palm and climbed to her feet and as fast as she could, knowing that she was she had lost and it was already too late. She went down to the final landing of the ground level. She looked around for the rat, but it was gone and the marble with it. Her hand strung where the skin had been scraped and there was blood to, um, trickling down her ripped pajama leg from her knee. It was as bad as the summer that her mother and as yeah, as the summer that her mother and then taking it training wheels off Coraline's bicycle. But then back but then back then in with all the cuts and scrapes, her knees and it had scabs on top of the scabs. She had had a feeling of achievement. She was learning something, doing something she had not known how to do. Now she felt nothing but but cold loss. She had failed the ghost children. She had failed her parents. She had failed herself and failed everything. She closed her eyes and wished that the earth would swallow her up. There was a cuff. <clears throat> she opened her eyes and saw the rat. It was laying on the brick path at the bottom of the stairs with a surprised look on its face, which was now several inches away from the rest of the of it. Its whiskers were stiff, its eyes were wide open, and its teeth in yellow and sharp. A collar of wet blood glistened at its neck beside the decapitated rat. A smug expression on its face was a black cat. It rested one paw on the gray glass marble. I think I once mentioned, said the cat, that I don't like rats at the best of times. It looked like you needed this one, however. I hope you don't mind my getting involved. I think, said Coraline, trying to catch her breath, I think you may have said something of that sort. The cat lifted its paws from the marble which rolled toward Coraline. She picked it up in her mind. A final voice whispered to her urgently. She has lied to you. She will never give you up now. She has you. She will no more give any of us up than change her, na than her nature. The hairs on the back of Coraline's neck prickled and Coraline knew that the girl's voice told voice told truth. She put the marble in her dressing gown pocket with the others. She had all three marbles now. All she needed to do was to find her parents. And Coraline realized with surprise that a bit was easy. She knew exactly where her parents were. If she had stopped to think, she might have known where they were all along. The other mother could not create. She could only transform and twist and change. The mantelpiece in the drawing room back home was quite empty. But knowing that, she knew something else was as well. The other mother, she, the other mother, she had plans to break her promise. She won't let us go, said Coraline. I wouldn't put it past her, admitted the cat. Like I said, there are no guarantees. She'll play fair. And then he raised his head. Lou, did you see that? What? Look behind you, said the cat. The house had flattened out even more. There's no longer a look like the photograph, more like a drawing, a crude charcoal scribble of a house drawn on gray paper. Whatever is happening, said Coraline. Thank you for helping with the rat. I suppose I'm almost there, aren't I? So you go off into the mist or wherever you go. I'll swallow. I'll, well, I hope I get to see you at home if she lets me go home. The cat's fur was on end and its tail was bristling like a chimney sweep brush. What's wrong? asked Coraline. They've gone, said the cat. They are 
aren't here anymore. They, the ways in and out of this place, they just went flat. It's that bad. The cat lowered its tail, swishing it from side to side angrily. It made a low growling noise in the back of its throat. It walked in a circle until it was facing away from Coraline, and then it began to walk backwards as stiffly, one step at a time, until it was pushing up against Coraline's leg. She put down a hand and stroked it, and could feel how hard its heart was beating, and was trembling like a dead leaf in a storm. You'll be fine, said Coraline. Everything's going to be fine. I'll take you home. The cat said nothing. Come on, cat, said Coraline. She took the step back toward the steps, but the cat stayed where it was, looking miserable and oddly much smaller. If the only way out is past her, said Coraline, then there's a way to where we're going to go. She went back to the cat, bent down, picked it up. The cat did not resist. It simply trembled. She supported its bottom with one hand, rested its front legs on her shoulders, and um, the cat was heavy, but not too heavy to carry. It licked at the palm of her hand, where the blood from the scrape was welling up. Coraline walked upstairs, one step at a time, heading back to her own flat. She was aware of the marbles clicking in her pocket, aware of the stones with a hole in it, aware of the cat pressing itself against her. She got to she got to her front door, and now just a small child scrawling of a door, and she pushed her hand against it, half expecting that her hand would rip through it, revealing nothing behind it but back, back blackness and scattering of stars. But the door swung open, and Coraline went through. That's also different. She, in the movie, she does take the cat with her, um, but he, he wasn't, like, afraid or anything like that, so that's different. So, and the Mr. Bobinski's, um, flat upstairs was a little bit different as well, um, because he does say in the movie, not even that anymore. It's pretty funny, but anyway, he's scary still here, because he was also made up from rats, so, but the black rats, that's pretty scary, and the decapitation, very, like, that's kind of, it's dis uh, disturbing. <laughs> but anyway, thank you guys so much for being here with me. Please don't forget to subscribe. Give me a thumbs up, comment, share, follow me on Instagram, 